significant. Um, as generations say, you know, how can I begin wedding these two paths together? Her new book, Motherhood as Metaphor, Engendering Into Religious Dialogue, will be out momentarily. So that, that's her second book. Uh, her first book is entitled Monopoly on Salvation. Question uh, mark. That's why I have to raise my, my voice. I am contemplating writing a book called I Am the Way with, uh, No One Comes to the Father But by Me. Question mark. But when I tell people, they, they say it with an affirmation, not an interrogation, which negates my whole point. <laughs> so it's tricky putting question marks on book titles, but she has successfully done that. Uh, among the lesser known skills <laughs> of Janine is that she is to be a, she's a sight to behold on the karaoke floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope she doesn't mind too terribly that I can Judith Plaskow, I suspect many of you know, is one of the four mothers of Jewish feminist theology. I'm indebted to her work because she's among the first persons I read as I moved into the work of being a Tillich scholar. Her work on Tillich is foundational for thinking about what feminism has to learn uh, from Tillich and how Tillich has much, much to learn uh, from feminist theology uh, on accounts of sex and sin and grace. So uh, she's been important to me in ways that are not necessarily the way she's best known, which is as a constructive feminist Jewish theologian for books like Standing, Standing Again at Sinai. I, when I hear women speak about what Judith means to them, it's really powerful. Um, so even even on Facebook yesterday, but on Judith is coming. <laughs> oh, I can't say how many times I've read Standing Again. Um, so the, the gift she's offered transformative power she bequeathed is really something. Uh, and I, I think we're both, both going to have to use, we're going to have to use language like blessing to describe what it means to be with both of these remarkable women. So thank you for being with us. Okay, so I'm going to speak first and uh, give me and we won't, um, we won't speak for too long and then we'll talk briefly with each other and I'll keep things up. <laughs> so let me say straight out that the question of truth per se has never particularly interested me, and I saw a lot of that as soon as I received this email. Um, the word truth doesn't come up very often in my work, and I certainly never focused on it as a distinct issue. But what has interested me very much um, is the problem of authority. I see this not just as a key feminist issue, but as perhaps the most important religious issue in the contemporary world. And I recognize that behind the question of authority there lurks the question of truth. The problem of authority arises because there are so many forces uh, in the modern world that have undermined the possibility of seeing religious texts as revelatory in any simple sense. Um, I talk about some of these forces in the uh, article that you probably read, the emergence of biblical criticism, the awareness of the existence of other religions. But I think the fact that we live in a pluralistic society means that we don't just know about people with different beliefs and practices, but that we ourselves may be those people, uh, and that we're members of uh, different communities that pull us in different directions. So like everybody else here, I'm shaped by my religious commitment, but also my work and my political commitments, my race and class, my sexuality, my national origins. I'm a Jew, but I'm also a feminist, a lesbian, an academic, an American who came of age in the 60s and who sees my own future as bound up with that of other communities. The, the question for me is how do I weigh these different commitments? 
religion? How do I know that they have the God? How do I know that anything uh, that I was taught in my 12 years of Catholic education uh, is true? Now, if there's no absolute foundation to our identities and practices, <coughs> how and where do we ground ourselves? Is there any firm place to stand? To my mind, feminism ups the ante on this question by offering a deep and wide-ranging critique of the patriarchal nature of canonical text. So the issue of authority is certainly not just a feminist issue, uh, but feminism crystallizes and intensifies it. Um, to me, this is a very important point because it says that feminism is not just about women. Uh, feminism, in the first place, is a movement on behalf of the whole humanity of all persons, but also on a methodological level. It raises many of the key questions that are inherent in modernity, authority uh, being an important one. So having said this, let me say uh, that there is no one Jewish feminist perspective on the issue of authority. Uh, just as there are many Judaisms, so there are many Jewish feminisms. Uh, for Orthodox feminists, halakha, Jewish law, both as a way of life and as a process for responding to changing circumstances remains authoritative. I, I imagine that's come out of your discussion in the last few days. For Orthodox feminists, any challenge raised by feminism has to be responded to within a philosophic framework, a Jewish legal framework. Uh, for a non-Orthodox feminist like me, halakha is not binding, um, if not irrelevant. Uh, very often it constitutes the over against to which uh, feminists or even non-Orthodox feminists are responding, but it's not the framework within which I struggle with feminist dilemmas. Um, this is a really important difference. If, if you were to go to a conference of the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance and then go to a conference of liberal Jewish feminists, you would find that um, it's not just that the approaches to certain issues are different, but that completely different issues would be being discussed. Um, you know, at a JOFA, uh, the Orthodox Feminist Conference, people might be talking about the legal warrants for women reading the Megillah, the Book of Esther, on Torah publicly. For uh, last time I was there, there was a session on whether women could be housed in the community for grace after meals, one of the legal sources around that. Uh, liberal feminists completely take these issues for granted. I mean, they're total non-issues. Uh, we might be discussing changing the language of the prayer book or the intersection of feminist and queer issues. So then the question comes up, what do Jewish feminists share uh, that the label feminist even can be applied to all of us. And, and I think that we share a number of things. First of all, we share a critique of women's marginality within canonical texts. Uh, we often disagree on the source and the depth of that marginality. Um, Orthodox feminists are likely to see women's subordination as a product of social conditions um, that have influenced the tradition that fundamentally is committed to justice, and that's always moving in the direction of equality. Um, not, some non-Orthodox feminists, myself among them, uh, are more willing to say that the tradition is flawed at a very fundamental level. Um, I argue that the basic Jewish concepts of God, Israel, and Torah are all formulated from a male perspective. But I think we agree that the narratives of Torah 
place men at the center. Uh, we agree that women too often are objects of the law rather than subjects and agents of the law. Uh, we agree that certain laws, those concerning marriage and divorce, uh, are profoundly problematic and, and have the ability to destroy lives. Um, I think this means, secondly, uh, that we agree that it's impossible to see <coughs> the entire tradition as revelatory, as true in any simple sense. Uh, again, you know, we will differ a lot on uh, how far we're willing to go in our questions. But I think there comes a point where even an Orthodox feminist will say, I can't believe that God intended X. You know, I can't believe that God intended women to be learned in secular subjects but excluded from Jewish studies. You know, I can't believe that God intended women to be trapped in a broken and abusive marriage. Um, and that means, thirdly, that all Jewish feminists are involved in a balancing act between allegiance to tradition <coughs> and commitment to the contemporary value of equality for women. And we find balance in different places. Um, but we're all struggling with the authority of contemporary insights concerning women's personhood in relation to the tradition. Uh, I should say, fourthly, we're all committed to uh, changing uh, the role of women in Judaism in the direction of greater equality. As a non-Orthodox feminist, <clears throat> I'm very interested in the intersection of authority with the issue of power. I approach uh, wrote the, wrote the claims of canonical texts with a hermeneutic of suspicion. I always want to know who wrote this text, what religious, social, political, and economic functions does it serve, who was part of the conversation in the circles that generated this text, who was excluded. I'm very aware that when the rabbis are offering new interpretations of laws governing the Sabbath or sexuality or dietary laws or at any subject, they're at the same time attempting to consolidate their own authority and worldview. So I'm interested in who accepted their decisions, what was the circle uh, for whom they were decisors. What about all those that who get left out by the process of the consolidation of power? How did the rabbis get to speak for the Jewish tradition? And that leads me to the question of who gets to speak for any tradition and how? Who owns the tradition? That's, that's a huge uh, question for me. I think one of the really important things that non-Orthodox feminism has been about <clears throat> is women claiming the power to define tradition. When I first formulated my critique of the sexism of Jewish tradition <clears throat> back in the early 80s, um, I was waiting for people with more power to uh, correct the injustices that I had named them. I thought, okay, you know, I named them, they're gonna fix them, right? Um, and I think when I go to Jofa conferences, and I, I try to go to all of them, uh, it seems to me that's where Orthodox feminists are. They're asking the rabbis, the learned legal decisors of the time to correct these injustices. Uh, but I and many other uh, non-Orthodox Jewish feminists have stopped arguing or pleading for entry. Uh, the tradition is ours. It's ours to shape. We've been creating new liturgies. We've profoundly influenced the prayer books of all the non-Orthodox denominations. We're like Midrash that fills in the silences. 
concerning women in Torah narratives. We produced new Torah commentaries. We rediscovered women's history and are attempting to influence curriculum. We're creating the Judaism we want to see um, without permission or external authorization. We're enacting authority. Um, I think this has been a very important uh, move in, in liberal Jewish feminism over the last several decades. So where does this leave the question of truth? Um, well, my friend Carol Prince and I, she's a, a goddess feminist, are currently writing a book about uh, goddess and god um, since feminism, um, in which we discuss the development of our own conceptions of god, and then we raise questions for each other. And Carol has been pressing me very hard by how it can remain within a patriarchal tradition that, as she sees it, has been destructive for women. And it's interesting to reflect on my response to her in the context of today's discussion, because in trying to articulate why, for me, leaving Judaism was never an option, um, the term I use is not true, but meaningful. Uh, and this is a very broad concept with many aspects. I mean, it has to do with identity, with locating myself in relation to a long and rich history. It has to do with a sense of community and the present. It has to do with ethics, uh, the imperative to do justice, even when doing justice may mean transforming Judaism. Uh, it has to do with fullness of life, uh, an embodied way of being in the world that Lainey uh, was talking about this morning that seeks God in everyday experience and that celebrates the cycles of the year and of individual life. Um, when I teach my freshmen about the concept of myth, I always say that though myths may not be true in a propositional sense, they provide us with a map of the universe in relation to which we locate ourselves. And that, that's really what Judaism is for me. Jewish stories are good stories to think with, um, even when thinking with them may be challenging and questioning them. Um, the issue of authority doesn't go away with the willingness to question the authority canonical text. Um, it, it actually brings me back to the scary questions that I raised initially. What, what gives me the right to question a religious tradition that claims divine origins and that, however we understand its origins, has been around for centuries? Um, how do I know what's too precious to be surrendered? Uh, in the name of what do I question? Um, as I argue in the assigned article, what's authoritative for me is a community of interpreters that I understand myself as part of and to which I see myself as accountable. It's from the community of feminists and especially Jewish feminists that I learn to see the co-humanity of women as a sacred principle. So it's actually clear to me what's not true than what's true. Uh, whatever diminishes the humanity of women and other persons cannot be true. Uh, beyond this, truth is something to enact along with others toward a future in which women are co-Jews and all persons. This isn't a process that offers no absolutes or certainties, uh, but I see it both as what we're stuck with uh, and what we have to enrich our lives. So I'll thank Judith for that. Uh, Judith, sorry to just clap because we're doing this event. People are going to clap at your hands here. <laughs> Because as I was thinking, Judith, the other day, I said not just 
just thanks for our conversation or for this presentation, but really for having been shaped by Judith's work over the last 20 years of my own um, work. And so, so some of what you'll hear um, is that there's a lot of overlap in my own thinking, even though I'm coming from out of the Roman Catholic tradition, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the way that I approach um, questions of truth. And, I, and Judith and I had a conversation um, a week or so ago um, in which she opened, essentially saying what she opened with you, that is that the question of truth really hasn't been one that's been at the forefront of her writing and her thinking, et cetera. And that got me to thinking, and I went back to the, to the new book, and I did a, a, a word search, right? So I've got 300 pages, uh, something like that, and the word truth comes up maybe 10, 15 times. And of those times that it comes up, many a time it comes up in quotes, right? <laughs> the truth. Um, so I have a few places where I'll bring in some of that just so you can hear um, some of the way that I'm approaching it. Um, and you'll hear that I'm, that I'm approaching it sometimes as truth production. Um, the production of truth, who produces the truth, how does it function, um, and you'll hear echoes of some of what, of what um, uh, Judith was, was saying as well. Um, but in order to get into to, to my own approach to truth and maybe the broader feminist approach to truth from a Christian uh, uh, and Catholic perspective, um, it's helpful to know that I approach this as a systematic theologian, right? That I, I think of my task as working with the tradition in a particular way, um, but as a constructive theologian. So I just wanted to say a, a few things about that because I think that it, it could be helpful um, as a framework for thinking about this production of truth or the question. Um, so I, made, it, I, I was uh, uh, introducing to my students uh, in an introductory course on theology, right, what is it that the project of, of theology is, what is it that the theologian does, um, and kind of looking at pre-modern ways, that's not my area, but kind of pre-modern ways of, of really kind of thinking about the truth as being revealed in scripture, right, and it's the theologian's job to really kind of just simply pass that on. Um, I think with modern theology, and, and, and we can think of Paul Tillich or others in the 20th century, um, we really wanted to say, okay, we have, certainly we have scripture, right, but we're also bringing experience into conversation with that, right, so we have the, the correlational method. Um, so many of you may already have that, have that sense, um, but in order to move to my next section, I have to, I, I to get up and move and a little bit, right, um, because I'm thinking especially with Francis schuster Fiorezza, whose framework for systematic theology I found incredibly uh, helpful, because he talks about uh, the role of the theologian not just bringing scripture and tradition together, sorry, yes, scripture and experience together, right, and, and finding meaning or truth from out of that correlational method, um, but rather to begin with, okay, scripture and tradition, and always to see that we're in the process of approaching that interpretation. And so he talks about the hermeneutics of scripture and tradition, right? If we were going to go over to this side, then we would have um, Paul Tillich's idea of experience, right? And bring these two things together. But Shusa Pirenza wants to say, well, experience, let's, let's pull that apart a little bit so that we have some various things we can look at, right, that shapes the theologian's approach to scripture and tradition in his or her truth claiming or meaning making. And the three elements, so these are the things, right? He says we have to look at different background theories right, that the theologian holds, right? And that those diverse background theories that are really implicit in a lot of what the individual or, or the community is doing right, is going to shape the way that they approach scripture and tradition. Um, a second component that I just spelled incorrectly that echoes some of what um, Judith has already said, right? Communities of discourse. So our background theories are things that we hold in our mind and that are, that are often very implicit. Our communities of discourse are the people with whom we're in conversation right, that help us make these interpretive judgments about the text. And his final component is the idea of having a retroductive warrant. A philosophical term that I know only through this theologian. So uh, uh, it, it has to do with Right, the practical outcomes of a particular way of, of making meaning or claiming truth. Right? So that the theologian, his or her job, right, is in a sense, yes, approaching scripture and tradition and, and engaging in an interpretive uh, 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 quest for truth or meaning. Right? But it's helpful to see that the theologian is shaped right, by a variety of 
right things in coming to engage scripture and tradition. And he sees these as a dynamic process. Okay. Uh, hopefully, that is, well, I, I have that on the board so that it can be helpful to point uh, to some of the claims that I make about the knowledge, production, and truth, right? And then think about right, what is it that the feminist theologian is doing. Yeah? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I uh, what's the the retroductive, the retroductive warrant um, has to do with the practical outcome of a, uh, a particular um, interpretation, right? So that the theologian uh, may come to the scripture and tradition and say, well, I can see in scripture and tradition these various things, my community of discourse um, will find them meaningful, and my, it, it coheres with my background theory, but the practical outcome of this way of thinking, right? has material implications, right? And the retroductive warrant has to do with those material implications that may not be embedded particularly in scripture or tradition, that the community of discourse may not be thinking about them, my background theory. The example relevant to, to the conversation here, the example that, that Shusuke Gurenji uses, right, is that in Christian theology, right, the construction of the Jews and the Jewish people, right, when the community of perfectly cohered with their background theory, their community of discourse, and, the, and the, their interpretation of scripture and tradition. Right? But as we move forward and see the way the history of Christian theological constructions of the other right, have damages done in history, that's where we feel the Is this in language of the word consequence be used? Yeah, sure, yeah. I think that, yeah. It's, sorry, I meant is this model Hillis? Uh, this is uh, Francis Schuster Fiorella. Isn't that a woman? Yes. Okay. Um, and the reason that I brought in Tillich is just to say that, that there's sort of a trajectory, right? From Tillich, who says it's not just scripture, but it's scripture and experience, and Shusha Fiorenza unpacks it now, mm -hmm. right, with these various things. Yes? Right. Okay. So give us, give us a place to start. Um, feminist theology has asked, right, if the production of theological knowledge, truth, and meaning, right, has been done exclusively here by the theologian um, as male, right, what difference does that make, right, how has that shaped the, the, what counts as truth, right, within the tradition. Um, so you can think about the theologian, right, and his or her experiences in forming certain um, elements of a background theory, and you can think of the theologian in, in a community that has been exclusively male, right, and how that shapes the production of knowledge. And so, um, echoing some of what, what Judith has already said, um, but here was one of the places where I found that I used the term truth in quotation marks on this idea here. Um, and I wrote, the construction of economies of knowledge, um, which is what I kind of um, use as a phrase to describe the frameworks of thinking, right, that theologies are part of, right, that we, we have this worldview um, and it's an economy of knowledge. In a sense. So the construction of economies of knowledge produced largely by men, has the result that women often find themselves both within and outside their tradition. They are within the tradition as active members of the community, having been shaped by sacred scripture or liturgy or ritual, but they are outside the tradition in its instantiation of knowledge. I think by which I mean both the construction and what's being claimed by this knowledge tradition. Having been produced by men, the knowledge systems of the tradition continue to privilege certain male experiences as having the ring of truth to masculinist ways of being in the world. Existentially, women often experience themselves as others by their own tradition, right? And so the, so the um, question of what has been promoted as truth, right, within uh, the Christian tradition or within a particular community, and how the shapers of that truth, right, um, uh, how, how the shapers of that truth have been gendered and how that experience of, um, is experienced differently for those who inhabit other subject positions, other gender subject positions. Okay, so that echoing, uh, again, Judith's um, uh, point raised earlier, feminist methodology is suspicious of truth production that has written out women, right? So in this process, writing out women and women's experience. If women experience a cognitive dissonance, right, between their own lived ex experience and what's being promoted as truth within their in their tradition. It gives them not only a lens into the type of knowledge that has been produced, but a lens to argue about how knowledge has been produced. That is to see uh, the method that Shusha Gurenza describes.
describes more, more clearly, right? and to see that truth, in quotation, that knowledge is interested, right? Uh, that it has material interests that are being served. And again, I think I'm echoing some of what, what uh, Judith has already said, um, but maybe saying it in a different way here. So I'll just read you uh, a section from this idea of knowledge as interested. And you'll see that I'm really talking here um, about knowledge. Um, I'm not really talking about truth, but I think that the, the way that I'm approaching knowledge might have this um, relationship with these questions of truth that we have. So I write, knowledge does not simply exist for human beings to access it. Rather, it's produced in communities that are now globally interconnected and materially interested. What counts as knowledge and truth is constructed within fields of discourse and culture and passed along through educational and embodied media. <coughs> this way of thinking about knowledge enables us to see knowledge as constructed, but also to witness in that construction the possibility of privilege and exclusion. Given the many different ways that knowledge can be construed, we can interrogate systems of knowledge to ask what material conditions are supported by particular ways of knowing. What structures of power and exclusion inform particular economies of knowledge in ways that create and invisibly defend privilege and dispossession? Those who serve as guardians of knowledge, as theologians do, within a community have power, while those with no access to the systems that will pass on this knowledge do not. Economies of knowledge can enrich the guardians, that is the theologians, with evident material gains and livelihoods as well as social capital. The exclusion from access can be built on cultural, religious, or gender differences. It can be patrolled with discriminations of economics, class, and race. There is a crucial intersection, then, between the guardians of Christian knowledge, which have been patriarchally conferred, barring the access of women, and their resistance to the presence of religious others. And so I ask, why is it so often the case that the same authoritative guardians reject the insights of women, and refuse the wisdom of other faiths. Knowledge serves a function that is proximate. It is interested and invested in the everyday. So too, religious knowledge is invested, not just in some ideal truth or hereafter, but in the social, material, and political contexts in which the knowledge is constructed. As we recognize the way economies of knowledge are interested and implicated in material social conditions in the world, we're guided by what philosophers call a retroductive warrant in participating in the creation of economies of knowledge. That is to say, in thinking about what will count as authoritative thought and practice, we must consciously recognize the practical outcomes of each distinct way of thinking. How does a particular way of construing reality have specific social, material, and political effects. Given the mystery that serves as backdrop for all knowledge, reasoning, and theologizing, and recognizing the manifestly multiple ways of structuring that experience and knowledge in face of mystery, we are free to be guided by pragmatic aims in our participation in a given system of knowledge. Does this way of thinking bring life and well-being? To whom? Does it restrict the well-being of others? <coughs> in feminist theology, the retroductive warrant has often been framed as the well-being of women, and it has been employed to assess and critique religious economies of knowledge. The use of such a retroductive warrant seems to be in play implicitly when many women actively respond to their received traditions and innovate change. So my second point is that feminist methodology illumines the way that truth production and knowledge systems are interested so feminist theology, um, I, I think of as being bent toward pursuing truth in its social, material, and textured realities. And I close here with a, 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 one of the, a third of one of the very few places that I use the, the, the term truth in this text. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking here with Leila Ahmed, um, a, a Muslim feminist. Um, as she, and I, I'm quoting her here. A feminist theological method invites us to witness the power of the divine not as some transcendent reality out there, but as one that empowers and enlivens us in here. Or, in the words of Leila Ahmed, we find religion and our human meaning, and I'm quoting her, always only here and now, in this body, for this person. Truth, only here and now, for this body, this person. Not something transcendent, overarching, larger, bigger, more important than life, but here and now, and in this body, 
and in this small and ordinary life. So that gives you some of the sense of a sense of some of the ways that I, I do use the, the term truth, um, and maybe we can continue this conversation and pull out some of the threads of where we overlap and maybe we move. Well, I, I'm really struck, <coughs> Jimmy, by the extent of our overlap. Um, the, we share a heart of suspicion, we share uh, a deep concern about the relationship between knowledge and power, their interest in practical outcomes of knowledge, and um, I mean, these, these overlaps aren't surprising because um, feminist theology has been an interreligious um, effort and the product of, of interreligious conversation from the beginning. So, so the, the overlap has been, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to exactly, so I don't think that it's, it's it's not only that I've been shaped by Judith, but that no. you and I must have some similar, you know, water that we've been swimming in right. in terms of this. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I was influenced by Elizabeth Schiffler, the you know, from yeah. the beginning of my work, and um, you know, began uh, working as a feminist in conversation with Christian first Christians. Mm -hmm. um, Is there though? Some way in which being Jewish and being Christian gives a different inflection to the way of being feminist. Did you detect difference there? Well, one of the uh, I, it's interesting because I think that the the places that we pointed to as conversation um, points and overlap have to do with authority and creativity. Okay, so as Judith was speaking, I was thinking about my own relation to authority as a Roman Catholic feminist theologian, um, and I can and I can wrestle a little bit with that, um, but, but the question of who owns the tradition is, is central, right? The, the, and, I, and I think that we could talk a little bit about how, how it's similar, but also how it's different. Um, given the centrality of this authority, I think that I can see places where Christian feminists have learned from their Jewish sisters right, creative approaches to authority in, in we talked about the, 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 the places where you can see feminist, Christian feminist theologians very early on in the feminist theological project claiming the right to midrash, claiming the right, right, to tell our stories, right, and there's nowhere in, there's nowhere in the Catholic tradition that invites that in a particular way, right, but, but Christian feminists were saying, wow, where can we find strategies, and it was this liberating moment of saying, there are some strategies that my my sisters of another faith are are deeply engaged in, and then and they grows out of their tradition. So that that was more of a point of overlap. But I don't know. If well, I, I, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, on the structural level, the fact that there is no there is no central Jewish authority uh, is really important. So the the question of who gets to speak to the tradition has a very different complexion uh, within. Uh, Catholicism, obviously, than it does in, in a pluralistic Jewish community or a fragmented Jewish community, depending on whether you see it positively or negatively. But there are many different centers in the Jewish community, and I, I try to communicate that. But another thing that emerges very clearly is that theology is a relatively marginal enterprise uh, within Judaism. So, you know, the, I, it seems to me that the question of truth is maybe more upfront uh, in a tradition in which theology is really important. I mean, in, in, uh, for Jews, the question is what's the authority of law? It, it, you wouldn't exactly talk about law as true or not true. I mean, it you know, comes from the source of truth or, or whatever. So, so I think the, the centrality of practice and law in Judaism gives a, a different complexion to feminist issues. Can I, can I just, can I just um, highlight further what Judith was saying? And that is that I was really struck, not just by the fact that you, Judith, uh, say, you know, I hadn't thought about it well, Janine was able to do an index search and find it. But what Janine said was that feminism is a means of accessing the truth. I think to me that was, or, or, or an approach towards it. That was the ultimate 
point goal is actually to get the truth. In whatever way you, you understand that. Yeah, I think that I, I think that I would say more that that feminism is a uh, uh, a means by which to produce. I think I, I don't say it's a way of pursuing truth. Pursuing truth. truth. Yeah, you said pursuing That's truth. That's right. Okay. And Judith, not only did she not say that, I'm not sure she can say that. Okay. Uh -huh. Right? She can't say that. <laughs> and I think this is the for, for our for, and, and Judith just highlighted why that is because the orientation towards action tackles it in one way and the orientation towards theology tackles it in another way. But I think this is a hugely important lesson and uh, lesson to be drawn. In other words, I think spiritually that that's a very big challenge because it's such a thing as a core motivation of how you're positioned in tradition. Maybe, yeah, tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, the starting, yes, you spoke about the commonality of method and, 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 and you learn from one another, in other words, which is feminist learning produced and sharing from a new set of suspicion. And yet, and yet, I think there's a big difference if you're you after truth in some way or if you're after meaning. And, the difference really becomes ultimately one of the ability in some way to surrender trust and believe that the tradition can deliver something to you, or that you, at the end of the day, you've got to create a kind of meaning within the tradition. I hear a difference that may be nuanced, and maybe more, and maybe I'm hearing wrongly, that's what I'm asking. I hear Judith saying that she and her and her her partners in these projects ultimately have to create their meaning and because they belong, they want to continue belonging, but they have to find a way of upholding and continuing the meaning. In other words, the meaning is not even given in tradition. Tradition or uh, is the building blocks for which you have to create the meaning. I don't hear Janine saying that. I hear Janine having some deeper sense of trust and faith that the tradition actually can deliver something. And now they are tasked with a new chapter that's revelatory in its own way by Asking new questions, we had blindfold on before. We had we had an interested approach to the truth. We want to free to pursue the truth as it is, and now we will help uncover uh, a different, deeper, richer, more textured, nuanced, whatever you want aspect of the truth that the tradition reveals to us. And this, so this it's a kind of letting go and receiving from the tradition, even though you're both engaged in the project of construction. But it's a whole other construction. You provide the meaning, or you open up the channels for the, for, the, for the tradition to, to to deliver that meaning to you. Am I overhearing you? Uh, I, I I think that I'm following, but if 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 you're suggesting that that this provides the truth, then it's then that's not what I'm saying. No, no, oh, okay. no, no. The, the 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 truth. This doesn't provide the truth. Okay. All these are methods, and you're applying all these as methods. To but produce truth. At the end, what you get is a truth, and you're not the one who's produced the truth. You get a truth. truth. What? You get a truth. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about the A or B. We're, 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 we're behind that. We're three days into this project now. But, uh, but uh, uh, all I mean is that you are not the one who's in charge of producing meaning. You're the one who's in charge of producing method by which a meaning comes to you, which ultimately is beyond yourself. And therefore, you're, you're engaged in some kind of a hermeneutics at, 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 at its end point, reveals something to you that comes from the source of your faith. Now that source of your faith may be God, scripture, tradition, some combination of the above. But ultimately through everything you've gone through and by neutralizing all the limited readings, you receive something. And, that, and, that's, and, and there, there, there's a moment or a dimension of openness to receiving that. And I think your approach to it allows for that in ways that Judas doesn't. Now Judas seems to agree with me, and I've got to convince you to agree with me. But, but I'm not sure if you're talking about a Jewish Christian difference, or I, I, I don't know what you mean with Greek, and I don't mean to, you know, assume that. But but for Orthodox feminists, the meaning is given. One has to find a way to um, create change within a given structure of meaning. So I don't, I don't think it's a Jewish Christian. In other words, Jews are Orthodox. Well, I, I don't know. The only uh, piece that I'm still not, maybe it's a semantic thing that I'm not clear on how you've been using the terms, but, and I'm wrestling with this in terms of the givenness of truth. Um, and as long as, I mean, there's a certain, there's a certain, there certainly is in my work a certain posture of receptivity to the mystery of our existence. And that's okay. That's and it's it's not 
yeah, so is that is what I was doing. That's not the word what I was trying to get. Mm -hmm. Free subsidy is what June does not free subsidy. She's paying the meeting. Is that true? Do you agree?
seems like in, for these reasons this is obvious, but in, um, in the kind of more the Jewish world, theologians are the people who are holding knowledge, I would say mm-hmm. rabbis are um, the equivalent there. Um, and I'm wondering if you feel like there are any other methods, um, or if there are any ways to occupy the space of rabbinic Judaism in which rabbis still do hold um, authority and knowledge, where um, that's done with the kind of feminist critique that you're talking about, or if it's that the project itself of um, people with authority and power, whether they're men or women or anything else. Does that, I don't know if that question makes sense. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so, so my question I think is, um, given the kind of tension that you're putting out between, um, I guess, authority and creativity and like authority and innovation, um, is there a way that you see as possible to infuse the kind of critique that you're giving of Jewish authority systems while still leaving room for um, inheriting and living out that uh, authority system. I, I think Tamar Ross does that magnificently in expanding the palace of Torah, where um, you know she offers a very ancient critique of, of, of certain halakhic methods. So it's really a meta critique, and at the same time, her purpose is to have had as if system still have authority for us, uh, you know, given this critique, and she uh, offers the concept of uh, unfolding revelation. I was curious about um, the, on the right side of the board, there's those contributes to her, the hermeneutics, and then uh, in approaching the, the positive the word of God um, that comes down to the spiritual tradition. I was a little confused by it. I understand what you meant by in the sacred, like a sacred text could be or but does scripture and tradition still hold a privileged place in the meaning that it's inspired? Um, it, it holds a privileged place in the family that I've been born into uh, and in the tradition that I'm a part of, and so it holds that privileged place. Um, but I think that the hermeneutics of suspicion, right, is such that scripture and tradition was created by, we won't, we can call them theologians, we can call them, you know, we can use that term very broadly. Scripture and tradition was created by human beings reflecting on their experience from other backgrounds or even material, right, what have you. So that scripture and tradition, in my own tradition, right, is flawed. It's, it's got gaps. Got, it's got things that are damaging to, to human beings and to women. Uh, and so, um, so, so yes, like, like lots of writings that people do, they are inspired by deep experiences. Um, but I don't know whether you were giving that a different... I guess it's sort of not inspired by those uh, In a different way than a poem would be inspired by I don't necessarily think so. I don't necessarily think in a different way than, than a poem would be. Um, I think that certainly it has been it has been seen two things. It has been seen as authoritative by the tradition in a different way than poems have been. Um, but we also have to see the very human um, process by which what has been come to be received as sacred scripture right, itself has political economic, material realities of struggle about what was going to get in and what wasn't going to get in. And that's one of the the fundamental approaches of of feminist historiography, right, is to say that what counts as truth, as sacred truth in the the scriptures and the tradition, has been the result of a whole lot of, uh, you know, very specific, gender-oriented machinations in, in, in historical perspective. So, I, my original question was really directed towards Judith because I actually wanted to hear your response, and I think that instead of hearing your response, I heard actually someone restating of what he thinks he would have heard, and then whether or not he agreed with his stating. That being said, as a Catholic woman who is called to a religious life, I have great stake in what is being discussed here. And I think that 
to be a misrepresentation of women theologians in the Catholic Church. And I, I want to say, first of all, that Janine's work is deeply important to me. So much of what you said struck me as what I was thinking about this morning as I was coming here. I was particularly taken with my conflict over some of the rationale that I'm struggling with around why women are not allowed to be part of the Catholic priesthood, which even if you're doing theology, your theology has, frankly, very little bearing <laughs> in that discourse. That's right. So on the one hand, I think you're talking about the hermeneutics of feminism and that being the, the, the hermeneutics of suspicion as a truth-seeking just, you know, kind of lens, just like queer theory and a number of other lenses can be applied and we can find truth in them. Then we have this issue of consequence. And I think as a person who does seek sacredness and does find meaning, I see sacredness in the text, I see meaning in the tradition, and I think that there are a lot of women like myself who remain um, in the Catholic Church with that kind of experience. The issue is really the lack of recognition of our humanness and consequence of that as, is that intended by God? Would God truly deny half of the human race or the human people um, access to something that's deeply important? Um, and when, when we're discussed, it's often as though our femaleness is not I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, but, well, and if you don't mind, I'm sorry, because I, I don't want to overstep with my, my friends here, that is, but, you know, I've been asking some questions, what, why are women, what, what's the discourse amongst men who are being ordained, um, and if you may, if you don't mind me sharing a little bit about some of what I've heard, was, you know, well, some of the men who want to be priests but can't become priests either, because for various reasons, they've been disqualified. But what occurred to me this morning is it's not disqualification based on the essence of who they are. It's disqualification based on something like if I'm going to a job interview and I'm not selected. And I might be disappointed. And I might say I was a good candidate. And I might be frustrated. But I'm not hurt on the same level as being told that because of the essence of who I am, because of the creativeness, my creatureness, something about that is not as beloved by God and not as sacred. Now that, that's a powerful thing, and that's a huge consequence. So, I mean, I think your presentation hits on so much of that, but I think it would be a misrepresentation to say that your particular slant as a theologian represents women in the Catholic Church who have remained in our struggle. Well, the only, the only um, correction that I would want to have, or, or, or clar clarity, um, is that um, I'm hearing you having heard me say that the, that scripture and tradition is not important and it's not sacred and it's not something to which I am I am uh, uh, in a variety of ways committing myself. Right. The answer that I was hoping would be heard was that scripture and tradition are are revelatory and are sacred in the same way that lots and lots of other things. So it's a broadening rather than a dismissing of tradition. Yeah. It's a it's a right that that. Um, uh, and it's not that I'm not I'm I'm, I'm the I'm not representing the feminist approach to Catholic theology as being outside the tradition. I'm representing it as being it being struggling with that. Absolutely, and you've articulated okay. here so much. Okay. That I think it's so important. And then I wanted to actually I had written down the exact wording of what you just said. Yes, you're correct. I didn't think that, and it was that feminism was a kind of a, a pathway to truth or that there was a search for truth in it. And you said, no, that's not, what did you mean when you said no? I mean, what, how, how do you understand this meaning versus truth thing in your own words? Because I, I really wanted to understand what you were saying. It's difficult for me to answer that because I see the concept of truth as so outside of what I'm aiming for. I, I, I almost don't know how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess for me, um, maybe it's that the notion of truth comes with claims to exclusiveness, that it's hard for me to think truth small t rather than truth capital that 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 is sort of built into the notion of truth as a capital T. Uh, and you know and, and, and the wording was feminism is a means of truth. That was the part that I was curious about. Was mm -hmm. feminism as a host as a as a and your that answers it for me the conclusion of the Um it just seems to me like with the I value scripture and tradition on Episcopalians 
that out, then your clergy minister to you in a certain way that is particularly male. And I had never really realized that until I left the Catholic Church and went to the Episcopal Church. And when I had a woman confessor for the first time, it was powerful because she could receive me in a way that my story mattered. And sin for a woman is different than sin for a man. I, I just don't even know how to, it's the same stuff, but it manifests differently, you know? And so it wasn't all about transcendence. It was about embodiment. And for the first time, that was received, you know? And so and this year, really, it's the first year that I have seen a woman do Eucharist over a period of time and preach. And so when you see that symbolically, and, and you watch somebody do that, and I'm also married to a priest, so I, I have seen very few women administer the sacraments in my life. So you, it, it's just it's just different. It's like your narrative is being taken into account, and you're being taken taken seriously for the first time in your life, you know. And so I, I think that's what is problematic about the scripture and the tradition is the narrative of women have been let out. It's been told in a way that it's not always well, positive. And I, I think that that, for me, that's the fundamental point of a feminist approach to these questions. If truth, or if we're going to say meaning, if truth slash meaning production, or oh, let me just say it that way, if truth slash meaning production is engaged exclusively by men, yeah, there, there are, there are I mean, the, you know, so all of what you just said, right, has to do with the reality that so many of our religious traditions have been have been engaged exclusively by men, and that and that women's experience, because not for lots of different reasons, but maybe opening up a different set of experiences with which we might find truth. 